Neurons communicate through an alternating pattern of electrical and chemical signaling. In today's lecture, we're going to start talking about that electrical signaling that goes on within neurons. Today, we'll go through the resting membrane potential, so we'll assume nothing is really happening. In the next lecture, we'll go through the action potential, when, when neurons are no longer at rest and actually doing something. Following that, we'll have a lecture on neurotransmitter release and neurotransmitter receptors. So we'll have two lectures for the electrical signaling that goes on within, and then two for the chemical signaling that, of course, leads to electrical signaling in the target cell. Of course, to understand resting membrane potential, we have to understand the ionic imbalance that exists at the membrane. Of course, the ion channels that allow ions to move through the membrane and create currents and potentials. And then we can put all that together to see what's going on at rest in the neuron. So we'll start off by reviewing the ionic imbalance and the basic structural elements of ion channels. And when we're talking about the movement of ions, it's really all about ion channels. Uh, they're about a thousand times faster than transporters, which are about a thousand times faster than pumps. So when we talk about a channel, we're talking about an open hole in the membrane that ions can move through freely in both directions. Now the movement of ions is really going to depend on what's their concentration on each side of the membrane and what's the current charge at the membrane. Now when we think about a resting neuron, and that's what today is about. Negative 70 millivolts is the ballpark estimate for any neuron. Certainly every cartoon neuron is going to rest at minus 70 millivolts. In real life, some rest a little more depolarized, some a little more hyperpolarized. It depends on the cell. At minus 70 millivolts, here we're talking about the charge difference right at the membrane. Not a difference in gross charge within the cell versus outside. So if we just consider a sphere here for our cell, we're not saying that all throughout the cell there's a whole lot more negative charge than outside. We're really talking about just at the membrane. We're lining the membrane more with negative charge on the inside, and the outside is lined more with positive charge. And the reason for this will be clear I hope, at the end of this lecture. Spoiler alert, it's because we always leak potassium. There's always this movement of potassium out of the cell, and potassium, of course, has a positive charge. That potassium is going to line the membrane, and the positive charge on the outside attracts negative charge from the inside. And that creates the negative membrane potential. I wrote this potassium very small because, well, there's a whole lot more potassium inside. That's why it wants to flow out. If you look here in this table, you'll see we have about 135 millimolar potassium inside and only about 3 millimolar potassium outside. So the diffusive force is pushing out potassium. To compensate for this difference in concentration, we have a whole lot more sodium and chloride outside the cell and much lower levels inside. So they tend to want to flow into the cell. Chloride a little less so because this negative charge is going to repel it a bit. But potassium, I'm sorry, but sodium for sure will want to flow in. We don't have a gross difference in the amount of stuff inside the cell versus outside. There's about the same amount of stuff, it's just we have different stuff. We got more potassium and impermeable anions, like phosphates, for example, floating around inside the cell. And outside, we have a whole lot more sodium and chloride, but about the same amount of stuff. So that we have about equal osmolarity in the cell and out. Cells tend to be a little, um, uh, tend to have a little more water within them, so a slightly lower concentration than outside. Sorry, slightly higher 
uh, concentration to help pull water in and keep them a little plump, but not too much. Right? If, if we have a whole lot more ions inside than outside and we bring too much water in, well, we're going to swell up and pop. And if we don't have enough ions inside to keep the water in, it's going to leak and we're going to shrivel. In both cases, the cell dies. So think of it as having roughly equal concentrations inside and out. It's just different stuff that's creating that concentration. And an easy way to remember this, sodium and chloride, that's salt. And life started in salt water. So when life originated, there was a lot of salt around. A lot of sodium chloride, because they're in salt water. So to distinguish the inside from the outside, we have low concentrations of salt inside, that's sodium chloride, but we bump up the amount of potassium. So the inside is different from the outside. The last ion on this table is calcium. Uh, there's essentially none in here. I didn't write anything because there's like no detectable levels of calcium. Because calcium and phosphate crystallize at millimolar concentrations. So we have to keep calcium levels very, very, very low. And there's a very small amount of calcium outside the cell. It's not a whole lot, but it's, it's still more than inside. So calcium will want to flow in, and it will come lecture five. So same amount of stuff. So there's no swelling, no shriveling. And when we talk about membrane potential, it's right at the membrane. Right, if you look at this cartoon neuron in the slide, there's positive and negative charge inside and outside. Where we really see the imbalances on those two different faces of the membrane, and that's why it's called membrane potential. And a potential is just, uh, just a buildup of charge. That's it. So we're building up charge at the membrane. Now what allows the charge to move around across the membrane is ion channels. And there's one element you have to have if you're going to be an ion channel. If I'm going to move through the membrane here, remembering, of course, that our membrane is a lipid bilayer, so we got that hydrophobic core. Charged particles can't move through here, so what I have to give them, if I'm going to be a functional ion channel, is some kind of hydrophilic core. So imagine this is a, a donut, and I've just kind of sliced it in half. I'm looking at that cross section of the donut. So there's a little more protein back here. There's some in front of it that I won't draw. But we've got a channel, a hole, that stuff can move through freely in both directions. So that we don't have to encounter that hydrophobic core. Right? Remember these are phospholipids, so that lipid component is hydrophobic. That's why it's hidden in the middle, not toward the, the water inside and outside the cell. And so anything charged, like sodium, potassium, and chloride, and of course calcium, notice these are all charged. They cannot move through the membrane, so they need a channel. So at the very least, you need the ion core. And it's just this part right here. That part right in the center that ions can move through. So you need a hydrophilic component that ions can move through. And usually within here we have different amino acids pointed toward the middle that can select for different ions based on size and charge. So it's not a wide open hole, it's just big enough for an ion and maybe the water molecules around it to move through. And lining this we can put charges. So if we put a whole bunch of negative charges in here, say right here, anything with a negative charge is going to get repelled. So if chloride tries to come through, nope, the negative charge will repel it. But positively charged ions, which are attracted to negative, won't have a problem moving through. So sodium could definitely move through here. This region is called the selectivity filter. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a filter that selects for different ions. And it does so based on size and charge. Potassium is a whole lot bigger than sodium, so it's easy to tell them apart. Even though they both have a plus one charge, they have a different size. And this is what's going to allow us to have ion channels that just let cations through. They're called non-specific cation channels. 
or sodium channels, or potassium channels, or calcium channels. So sometimes we're selected for just one ion, sometimes we just care about the charge. Any old cation can come through, or any anion, I don't care, bring it on. So there's your bare minimum. You gotta have the ion poor, otherwise you're not a channel, and you gotta have the selectivity filter. From there we have two optional components that we call gates. So we think of the membrane as a fence. You don't jump the fence, you go through the gate. We're not animals. We have two types of gates. There's an activation gate and an inactivation gate. And rather than draw this, I'm going to rely on my cartoon that I've already drawn for you. <clears throat> the activation gate is exactly what it sounds like. This is going to open up. Open up the gate. Let the ions move. So the activation gate kind of closes the pore until one of two things happens. Either a ligand binds like a neurotransmitter, that causes it to open. So look at the top there. When the ligands bind, that causes a change in the structure of this ion channel. So it pulls the activation gate out of the way and opens up a hole. Opens up that ion pore. So that's an example of how a neurotransmitter receptor would work. Some chemical signal causes this ion channel to open. As we're going to find out in the next lecture, other ion channels open up based on the charge within the cell. What do I have lining my membrane? Is it a whole bunch of negative charge, like at rest? Or have I started to line with maybe a little more positive charge? Well. The charged amino acids that make up this ion channel are going to respond to the changes in charge at the membrane. So rather than being ligand gated, they're voltage gated. So we'll pull open that activation gate only if we depolarize a little bit. Usually in this case we have some positive charges that help make up the ion channel. And so when we build up positive charge that pushes this away. And whenever we push that gate up, that sort of pulls open the pore at that point. So whether you're ligand gated or voltage gated, you need something to move that activation gate and open up the pore. The inactivation gate is also optional. Uh, voltage gated sodium channels have this, but most ion channels don't. So most ion channels have an activation gate, most don't have an inactivation gate. But both of these are optional. The inactivation gate is, is a, a separate site that closes some random amount of time after the activation gate opens. So this is going to block the pore. So the activation and inactivation gates are exactly what they sound like. One activates the pore, the other inactivates it. And we'll go through why that distinction matters in the next lecture. But that's it. That's all you need for an ion pore. Now, if all you have is the ion pore and the selectivity filter, well, you're what we're talking about today. You're a leak channel, and you create the resting membrane potential. Notice you don't need anything. We don't need a ligand to open an activation gate. We don't need to change our membrane potential. So when you're at rest, the only thing moving across the membrane is what can move through leak channels. So in these leak channels, or any channel for that matter, ions move according to two forces that act on them. There's the diffusive force, and then the electrical force, because these things are charged. And the charge at the membrane is going to affect how they move, just like charges in the ion channel affect how they move. We have to consider both of these. The diffusive force is pretty much constant. We always have uh, way more potassium uh, inside than out, and way more sodium and chloride outside than in. And that really won't change. The electrical force will change, because the way that neurons operate is by changing their membrane potential. So the electrical force is going to change 
all the time. The diffusive force better not change. Sometimes these oppose one another, like in the case of potassium over there. Potassium, of course, wants to leave because there's more of it inside than out. So random motion will tend to make it move out. But at the membrane, we have a negative charge. That negative charge is going to attract potassium. So which one wins? Well, it's going to leave. There will be a net efflux of potassium uh, up until a point. And we can actually solve for the point at which it stops leaving later on using the Nernst equation. So we'll solve this riddle later. First, let's go through each of those forces to get some idea of kind of why we think the diffusive force is constant. And we think so because it is. So uh, look at this drawing over here. So I've drawn for you a, a, a cell with a pretty typical diameter of about 15 microns. That's typical for a neuron cell body. I've drawn the membrane and the area where ions move to scale. So the membrane is purple and then the ion movement area is red. Can you see all the red on the bottom left there? Of course not. We have to zoom in quite a bit. So if you look at the, the top left, you'll see just right around the membrane. That's where we have ion movement. Because these things aren't that fast. You know, they, don't, they don't move that far. They just kind of move around locally and randomly in different directions. And so only those ions that are within about four nanometers of the membrane, so very, very close, only those are going to actually have the chance to cross the membrane. So we're not moving all of the ions in the cell. So if you look on the bottom left, most of that cell is gray. It's not red. So most ions aren't moving. So we're dealing with a percentage of a percentage of our ions that can actually cross the membrane. So of course the diffusive force is going to be constant. We're really not moving that many ions. If you're into graphs, you can look on the right side. And there I plotted distance from the membrane on X and then the percentage of ions that could cross. If you're right there at the membrane, zero nanometers away, all those ions could cross. Once you get about four nanometers away or so, we're pretty darn close to zero percent of the ions crossing the membrane. So that's one aspect that makes us think diffusive force is constant because we're really not moving that many ions. The second thing that keeps diffusive force constant is the sodium potassium ATPase. So here we're talking about channels, but the thing that keeps this whole thing going is a pump. The sodium potassium pump. Now there's no hole in here that ions can freely move through. Instead we have binding sites. There's a binding site that we open up here inside and we'll shift that to a binding site outside by spending ATP. So this protein changes its shape to move all the ions. As opposed to just opening a hole and letting the ions move, we actually guide them. So we'll take two potassium ions from the outside and after they bind to their binding sites, that triggers the enzyme to change its shape. So it'll then transition to opening up toward the inside. That change in shape destabilizes the interaction with those two potassium ions so they come off and it opens up binding sites for three sodium ions to come in and bind. That binding triggers a change in shape in ATP hydrolysis so we flip back over here that change in shape destabilizes my three sodium ions, so their binding site isn't stable anymore, so they get out of there. And it opens up the potassium binding sites again. And so we just keep doing this all day every day and spend somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of our ATP on it. So it's a fairly important enzyme. It's using a whole lot of energy to keep a lot of sodium outside and a lot of potassium inside so that we keep that ionic imbalance. So, we don't move a lot of ions, and those that we do move, we spend ATP to pump back across. So the diffusive force is constant. That thing never changes. So the only thing we really have to think about is the electrical force, and that's nice. The problem is the electrical force always changes. So let's consider an example here. Let's think about the movement of sodium. 
the cell rests at minus 70. That's a negative charge. Sodium has a positive charge. So the negative charge is going to attract it. All right, we'll get a big old sodium channel here. Got my ion four. So lots of sodium outside. Very little sodium inside. So my diffusive force pushes me in. The electrical force, because I have a negative membrane potential, also pushes me in. So what's sodium going to do? Of course it's going to go in. Both of these forces agree. It's going to go in and it's going to line the membrane. We're going to start to put that positive charge at the membrane. What happens to the membrane potential? Of course, it's not going to stay as negative. We're going to start to depolarize. So we'll go more positive. And let's say we hit the point of zero millivolts. I know it doesn't seem positive, but it's way more positive than negative 70. At zero millivolts, well, we have no electrical force anymore. So that's gone. But we still have a diffusive force. That thing is constant. So sodium still comes in, just not quite as much but it still comes in. So we still line the membrane with positive charge. And we'll continue to do so until we become so positive that we have an equal force repelling the influx of sodium. And it turns out that's somewhere in the ballpark of positive 56 millivolts. At that point I have enough positive charge that I repel sodium with the same force that that diffusive force pushes it in. Sodium still moves. It still comes in, but it also still leaves. And it does so at equal rates. So what happened here? When we were negative, let's think about our, our current as a function of membrane potential. When we were negative, we had a whole lot of sodium moving in. We had an inward current. At zero millivolts, it was still moving in, just not quite as much. And it wasn't until we got to like positive 56 that we had zero current. If we could somehow make the cell even more positive, sodium would leave. We have an outward current of sodium. And that's what we call this potential right here, the reversal potential. Because this is the point at which the net movement of ions reverses. So we have no net movement of ions. We went from sodium coming in to leaving at the reversal potential. That's where the current reverses. It's going from negative to positive in that case. So how do we know that it's positive 56 millivolts for sodium? The Nernst equation. Very simple plug and chug. I even have a calculator for you. I won't expect you to do any of these calculations on an exam, but you have a calculator there. You could use it. And if you were to plug and chug, all you need to know is the internal and external concentration of each ion, and I've listed those for you. If you were to plug those in or just read in the notes, you'd find that the reversal potential for all the ions that we deal with it's pretty easy to calculate. So if you were to put them on a number line, over here at about negative 102 millivolts is potassium. That should make sense. There's a lot of potassium inside, so it wants to leave. In order to prevent it from leaving, we need a very negative charge. Turns out we need negative 102. Remember, we rest around minus 70. So potassium currents hyperpolarizes. Chloride. Chloride is going to reverse a little bit below rest, but not much. So pretty close to rest. Then on the other side of things, and I don't know if this is going to end up to scale, we got sodium, and even further beyond that, I don't know, 125 or whatever, I've written calcium. These values 
tell you where the current reverses. But importantly, they tell you what's the membrane potential that we're going to approach if we open up an ion channel. Let's say a potassium channel. Well, we're going to move toward potassium's reversal because if you open an ion channel, it's if you open a potassium channel, potassium will leave until we have a negative 102 millivolt membrane potential. You won't have a net influx of potassium until you're below this. So if we're resting at minus 70, right, this is rest. If we open a potassium channel, of course our membrane potential is going to get more negative. Potassium wants to leave. That diffusive force is much stronger than the electrical force because we're only at minus 70. We need minus 102 millivolts of electrical force to offset that diffusive force. On the other hand, if we open up a sodium channel, we will depolarize. The membrane potential will move toward positive 56 millivolts. It might not make it, but we will move toward it. Sodium will enter the cell because the cell is more negative than its reversal potential. We don't have a strong enough electrical force to offset that diffusive force. So if you know the reversal potential for your ions, you know how they'll behave. Because they always want to bring the membrane potential toward their reversal. And depending on how far away we are, that determines how much of a current we generate. Because that difference between our current membrane potential, let's say it's minus 70 at rest, and the reversal potential, that creates what we call the driving force. So that's how much of a difference do we have. The bigger the difference, the greater the current, because we have a much stronger force imbalance between our electrical and diffusive forces. <clears throat> you don't need to know the exact numbers. That's probably not going to serve you well, but you should remember potassium hyperpolarizing, no doubt. Chloride, pretty close to rest, and you know what? That's good enough for its function, because if we're resting, we're not active. And that's the only thing chloride currents are going to want to do. Prevent us from being active. Sodium. Depolarizing. It's going to be something positive. More than enough to get the job done. Calcium. Very depolarizing. We will very rarely use calcium to change the membrane potential because it's a little dangerous. Some neurons do it. For the most part, this is just going to act as a secondary messenger and allow neurotransmitter release or to activate some kinases or something. So not a big player in the membrane potential, more of a secondary messenger to make something happen. These are the big three. So sodium depolarizes, chloride holds us at rest, and potassium hyperpolarizes. If you remember that, that's good enough. <clears throat> now. When we consider the resting membrane potential of the cell, we can't just think of one ion current at a time. Because they're all moving across the membrane to some degree. Certainly potassium is the biggest contributor, but there's leak channels for everything. And we have to be talking about leak channels at rest. If we're talking about a true resting neuron, it's not firing an actual potential, so there's really no voltage-gated ion channels open and it's not getting input. Right? It's resting. It's not listening. Nothing's going on. If nothing is really going on, it's only leak channels. So, here in this cartoon, we have one leak channel right there in the middle, and then a whole bunch of either ligand or voltage-gated ion channels, but they're not doing anything because we're at rest. They'll do something in lectures uh, 4, 5, and 6, but not right now. Now, we could put together three Nernst equations, and that's what we've done here. This is the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation. All it is is three Nernst equations put together. So we're creating a weighted average of the reversal potentials for these three ions, because remember we don't use a whole lot of calcium. That's dangerous. 
we have our sodium, our chloride, and our potassium Nernst equations. And then we weight them based on how permeable is the membrane to each ion. Now you could certainly plug and chug here, and I've made a calculator for you to do that. But I'd rather have you think about this a little more logically. And I won't expect you to do any calculations. So if we change the permeability to any one of those three ions, the resting membrane potential moves toward that ion's reversal. So if we were to plug in the values that I've given you in the notes, we're actually resting at minus 73, which is pretty close to minus 70. Now let's think about driving force here. That thing matters. So what's the driving force for chloride? Well, 3 millivolts. Is that a lot? I, I don't know. Why don't we compare it with some other ions, like potassium over here? Well, a 29 millivolt driving force seems, seems a little better. Wait, is that 31? That's 31. Don't listen to me. Is that right? Why am I so stupid? It's 29. Don't not listen to me. Okay. And then going from uh, 73 to 56 millivolts, let me embarrass myself again here, 129. Oh. Massive driving force. So if we were to open up a chloride channel, we have very little driving force, so we wouldn't expect much change in our membrane potential. And if you go into my calculator and play with the permeability of chloride, you'll find it doesn't change the membrane potential very much, because we're already pretty close to the reversal. But if you start to play with something like potassium, where we actually have a driving force that's about 10 times that size, yeah, that's going to affect the membrane potential for sure. Sodium will have an even greater effect on the membrane potential, because we're dealing with 129 millivolts of driving force, I think but much greater than all these others. So by changing the permeability, we move toward that ion's reversal, no matter what. If we're already pretty close to it, we probably don't move that much. If we're far away from it, and we're going to generate strong currents, well then we'll probably have a greater change in our membrane potential. Rather than calculating it out, the only rule I want you to remember is that if you open an ion channel, the membrane potential moves toward the reversal of that ion channel. If it's a potassium channel, it reverses down here in hyperpolarizing potentials. If it's a chloride channel, it reverses near rest. If it's a sodium channel, it reverses at positive potentials, so we depolarize. If it's a non-specific cation channel, that reverses at zero millivolts. It's still depolarizing. So no matter what, doesn't matter. If you open an ion channel, the membrane potential moves toward the reversal of that ion channel. There is never an exception to that. So do remember that rule. That'll serve you well. And if you know the ballpark reversal potentials for your potassium chloride, sodium, and of course non-specific cation channels, you'll know what the membrane potential is going to do. So let's say we have a nice little green neuron here resting and we put a pipette on it. Turns out it's resting at minus 70 we find ourselves a cartoon neuron. Now, if that neuron increases its permeability to potassium, we already know what's going to happen. If you open up potassium channels, we move toward potassium's reversal, minus 102. So we're not going to be minus 70 anymore. We're going to be something more negative than minus 70. We won't necessarily hit 102, because remember, we're still permeable to sodium and chloride. So they're also pulling the membrane potential toward their reversal we're just going to shift a little closer to potassium's reversal. On the other hand, if we were to increase permeability to sodium, well, we already know what's going to happen now, too. We're going to move towards sodium's reversal, because that's the rule. There's no exception to it. We're going to move toward sodium's reversal, so we're going to depolarize, move toward that positive 56. And this is exactly what's going to happen in the action potential in the next lecture but in reverse order. First we'll move towards sodium's reversal, then potassium's, and then we'll go back to rest. And that's it. Now, the rate at which a neuron changes its membrane potential, or in other words, how quickly it approaches 
the reversal for these ions it depends kind of on how big it is. That's one, one aspect of this. It really depends on the time constant tau. And that's, that's the product of two things. Membrane resistance, membrane capacitance. So how quickly we can change our membrane potential is a function of those two elements. Tau tells us how long it takes to get about 63% of the max. I think an illustration might help that. So if we're recording from a neuron, here's my pipette, I got a little electrode, I patched on, I can inject current. So if I inject a square wave of current, I'm giving it, let's say, 20 picoamps, something like that. Not that much, but enough to cause some depolarization. So here's my current that I injected. I gave it this, and I gave it 20 picoamps right away. That neuron is not going to depolarize to its max immediately, and when I remove the current, it's not going to repolarize immediately. It's going to have this curve. So here's my square wave. This is what it should look like, but it doesn't. The membrane potential changes a little more slowly, and that's because of the capacitance of the membrane. The membrane is very thin. And it's also completely impermeable to ions, and that makes it an excellent capacitor because the ions on both sides can't go anywhere, they can't go through it, there is no around it, so they're stored there at the membrane. I'll color this in, here's my membrane, very, very thin. Because it's so thin, these charges on both sides can attract each other and hold one another there. And that storage at the membrane is what slows this change down. So the first little bit of current that we inject essentially gets robbed. Think of it as taxation. The membrane takes a little bit of that current before it can let it move throughout the cell. That's why we have this curve here. Now, the amount of time it takes us to get 63% of whatever the max is, that time right there, that's tau. And that's going to be the product of membrane resistance times capacitance. So the more capacitance we have, the longer it takes. So we're going to see an even slower curve if we increase capacitance or if we increase resistance. If it's harder for charge to move across the membrane, of course it takes longer for us to charge that membrane and then affect membrane potential. Why do you care? If you even care, I don't know. But if you were to care, this allows neurons of different sizes to respond differently to inputs. So a big neuron isn't going to respond as quickly as slow neurons. So the larger you know, projection neurons of the cortex, they're going to be a little slower to respond than the smaller local circuit neurons. And that, that kind of slowness, that holding on to charge, it's almost like memory for the neuron it remains depolarized a little bit longer than the input it received. And that kind of, I guess, extends the voting window, if you will, of synaptic inputs. But it allows us to have different responses to, in, to fast and slow inputs, where very rapid changes are detected by the local neurons, but more stable responses are going to come from the larger neurons because they're kind of looking over a longer period of time due to their increased capacitance. The other thing we need to think about besides time is how far can charge move within the cell. So if we inject a little current, it's going to move around in the cell and it's going to essentially diffuse. That amount of current, that amount of charge is going to decrease as we move away from the source. This is really important whenever we're considering synaptic potentials. 
let's say I've got a, a, a dendrite here, and dendrites taper, so they, they're going to be a little thinner as you move away from the cell body. Uh, we'll get a cell body right here. So here's my soma, I'll get a little nucleus there, so that we know it's the soma, and this is a big old dendrite. Now if we were to inject current here, we'll get, oh I don't know, let's call it 5 millivolts of depolarization. As you move away from that site, we're not going to experience 5 millivolts of depolarization the whole way. We're going to experience less depolarization. Or you can think of this as a myelinated axon. Here we are at the node. At each node we generate some degree of depolarization and as you move further away it dilutes, just like dyes in water dilute. The rate at which our charge dilutes over space is called lambda. So lambda here is based on two things. It's a ratio, the square root of a ratio, of the resistance at the membrane over the internal resistance or the resistance inside the cell. Lambda is how far we can travel before we decay by 63%. So kind of like tau, but instead of time, it's distance. So we inject that 5 millivolts here. That's 5 millivolts of depolarization. That's going to decay as a function of distance. How far we can travel depends on, well, how leaky is the membrane. If we have a bunch of open channels in this dendrite, for example, more charge is going to escape out. So if we decrease membrane resistance, we're going to decrease our lambda, and that charge won't travel as far. On the other hand, if we were to let's say decrease internal resistance by, I don't know, maybe having a tapering dendrite here, we're going to increase lambda because we have a smaller denominator. So we can travel farther. So the charge that comes in in the dendrites, it's going to move in both directions. It won't move as far this way because of the increase in internal resistance. Instead, that charge is going to tend to travel toward the cell body because of the lower internal resistance of the tapering dendrites. But this is considering only passive movement. We're not propagating the charge. We don't have voltage-gated ion channels to keep it moving forward. Everything is passive in today's lecture. The big thing that I want you to understand are reversal potentials. Those are key. And if you can remember at least a rough ballpark value for sodium, potassium, chloride, I guess calcium is also kind of good to know, and then non-specific cation channels, you're good to go. So make sure you review the Nernst equation and the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation, and you appreciate that the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation is just weighted Nernst equations. If you really understand all that stuff, you're good to go. Tau and lambda are a little less important to understand, but they do help us think about how charge moves in time and space. But all of that flies out the window once we get into the next lecture and we start thinking about active propagation of charge. This is all passive. If we were to only inject charge at one point, but that's not what happens in real life. We'll have multiple points of charge injection because neurons are going to form hundreds of thousands of synapses. They can all be active at the same time to help propagate charge forward. If the neurons were only passive, life wouldn't work. Because as you can see, that charge is going to decay over time and space. We got to have a way of keeping it going. If you have any questions on this material, please use the questions box so we can go through those in class. Otherwise, I'll see you later.